Hi guys, my name is Carissa. This is the Fat Girl Flow channel, and today we are going to talk about why the plus size industry hates fat people. Let's just put it out there. That is what we are talking about. We are in my office today. You guys don't see this very often because quite honestly, I don't come to my office very often. So to start this video, uh, I should say that I asked questions on Instagram that you guys wanted to get answered about the plus size fashion industry. And it's important to note that like, I do not think of myself as a fashionista or someone who's like very, very in touch with um, what's cool or anything. But I do have a lot of experience on the manufacturing side of plus size clothing. If you're new to the channel, I created a merch line when we found out that we couldn't find shirts past a 4X, except for like Fruit of the Loom unisex shirts and stuff, we decided to manufacture our own t-shirts, which means we created the pattern, found someone to cut and sew them, priced them ourselves, decided what fabrics to use, made the tags, I mean the whole thing, the shirts were built by me from the ground up. Now this is just a t-shirt line, it obviously doesn't like mean that I have massive amounts of information on everything in the plus size industry, but I do manufacture clothing. So I have a little bit of information on it. And I thought that this would be a good opportunity for y'all to be able to ask me questions about what it takes to manufacture clothing, um, why certain things in the plus size industry happen, how uh, the plus size industry kind of works, um, any kind of questions you have about like influencers and their work with plus size clothing companies. I opened it up. I'm letting y'all ask as many questions as you want. Yes, a plant did just appear right there because it was annoying me that there was no plant there. So I went and put one there. And I don't want to reshoot the entire intro. Mama ain't got time for that. Overwhelmingly, the thing that y'all want to talk about is prices and why plus size clothing costs more than straight size clothing. I am going to answer some other questions before we get into that because I think that as I answer questions, it will kind of build on our understanding of what happens when you manufacture clothing. And I think that that will help when I'm trying to explain cost differentials and stuff like that. I think it's important for me to say also that while you can trust certain influencers, of course, I hope that uh, you guys trust what I say, that everything anyone ever says, but especially anyone like an influencer or someone who makes money off of the plus size industry, anything that they say is gonna be filtered through that lens. When I talk about things, I am as honest with you guys as possible, but it's always important to remember that I am making money off of this industry. So my view, of how all of this works is really capitalistic. You know, your values around capitalism can vary. Mine, I really, really struggle with. It is an interesting thing to hate capitalism and also be so heavily participating in it. While we talk about this, just keep in mind that I am talking about this from a place of like reality. And while I don't necessarily love the system that we are working within, it is the system we are working within. And this video is not to talk to you guys about how I challenge that system. It is to talk to you about how I function within that system. The first question is what brands, in my opinion, are of the highest quality. I am going to generally talk about brands in the mid-range price point. I don't frequently shop high-end stores. Um, I don't frequently spend over $100 to $150 for a piece of clothing ever. Um, so while there might be really incredible designers out there who are making $300 jackets, that is not really my forte. It's not the thing that I shop the most for. It's not something that I have a lot of experience with. So mostly I'll just be talking about stuff in the mid-range price point. Um, I would consider that like 50 to $150 per piece. I love Eloquy. I think that Eloquy is genuinely doing like solid, solid work in the plus size industry. Um, they have gone through a acquisition in the last many years, at least since I've been doing YouTube. Um, they like have restructured their brand and rethought a lot of things. They've expanded their sizes. Um, 
every time I get something from them, I think it is very well made and I like them a lot. I think there are probably a lot of other well-made clothing companies out there. I would consider Torrid Clothing far below Eloquii. Um, I would consider Forever 21 even further below Torrid. Another question that we got is how to buy plus size fashion sustainably. <sighs> This is a loaded question for me. Um, I am of the belief that plus size fashion is not where it needs to be in sustainability, in eco-consciousness, in any way, shape, or form. I mean, it's not even like bumping the mark. There are maybe a handful of brands that are doing it and maybe three brands that are going above a size 24 and doing it. Uh, I do not think that that is enough clothing options for someone to commit to sustainability. I think that after not having options for all of our lives, um, it is very hard to commit to being eco-conscious in your clothing because being plus size comes with a certain amount of marginalization and oppression and part of what empowers people to express themselves and feel empowered outside of their marginalization is to dress themselves how they want. So I would hate to ever say that it's plus size people's responsibility to be sustainable in their clothing options because it's really important to empower ourselves, if that makes sense. There are a few sustainable clothing brands. Uh, Eileen Fisher comes to mind. I'm going to put tons of links in the description of this video. I will link as many plus size sustainable clothing stores as I can possibly think of in the description box down below. They are out there, they are available, they are wildly expensive, and they generally do not go up to the sizes that many plus size people need. I'm gonna try to tie the next few questions together. The first one is how many factories on average openly carry plus sizes? Um, there's, I don't think that there's really any way for me to put an exact number on it. But every year there are markets in the US where wholesalers from overseas, from the US, come to these markets and they show different companies uh, what they have available. The plus size portion of these wholesalers is growing. It's growing at an okay rate, but I wouldn't say that it's like growing exponentially. Here is how wholesaling works. When you go to Forever 21, they're, they are purchasing from a large wholesaler. Basically, they're like overseas wholesalers that have these huge catalogs of the things that they make, and a lot of them are ripoffs from other companies. Um, a really good example of this is Gabby Fresh has a bikini line, and she creates all her designs, and it's amazing, and we're all always so excited for it to come out, right? And every time the the wholesaler's new catalog comes out, they have looked at what is cool in the US, the new things that have dropped, and they have recreated them with like minor differences so that they can't be stolen. I don't know this about her, okay? I'm just using it as an example. But let's say Gabby Fresh and Swimsuits for All makes these designs and they make them in a quantity of, let's say, 50,000 pieces. Anytime you make more units, you're able to drive the cost down because that's how buying in bulk works. So then a company overseas can make a knockoff of this beautiful Gabby Fresh swimsuit and make, instead of 50,000 units, 100,000 units and cut the cost. That makes people go over to this company that wholesales them and purchase them from them because you can get it at a smaller cost. This has always happened in fashion. Um, it is it is not as pretty right now. Uh, with wholesalers and stuff, it's pretty, like they are full on ripping off people's designs. But how it used to work is we would see these spring shows, right? We'd see um, runway shows in the spring and by the next season, wholesalers and manufacturers would have seen those designs, created things that are reflective of the styles and the trends, and created them and mass produced them to make it affordable to other people. You see something on the runway now and you're like, whoa, that's really wild, but then in two seasons you see it in streetwear and it has become affordable to everyone. That's kind of how the fashion industry works. 
I am obviously simplifying all of this. So there are all these wholesalers and some wholesalers have exclusive contracts with certain stores. I don't know this, but I would bet that Forever 21 has a specific wholesaler who sells them designs that they are not then allowed to go to another store and resell. They probably do this because they get a massive amount of business from Forever 21 so they can afford to not resell that design other places. If you have ever shopped like boutique stores online that are plus size, you will find that you are seeing a lot of the same clothes sold over and over and over again. You will also notice that the clothing is very frequently on the same models. This is because all of those stores are purchasing from the same wholesalers. There are not a lot of wholesalers out there for plus size clothing. Um, that number goes down even more significantly when you're looking for anything above a 3X. There is not a big market for plus size clothing. Not in wholesale, not in the world, it's just not that big. Uh, it, like I said, it is becoming bigger, but it is a very, very slow growth. And uh, since I have been doing fashion-y stuff online, the amount of wholesalers for plus size clothing, it just, it hasn't, the dial hasn't moved that far. Know what I mean? Someone asked, why do so many plus size influencers stop their lines at size 24? Is it really about the money? No, it's not. Part of the reason influencers and many people stop their lines at size 24 is because that is the size that these wholesalers go to. A lot of people are not actually creating their designs or designing something that um, is new and fresh. Some are, I'm not speaking for every single person, like Gabby Fresh designed in her own bathing suits. Uh, but there are a lot of people who are just purchasing wholesale, who have just found a wholesaler overseas to work with and who pick and choose some designs and then put those into their store. Um, it is not easy to get these wholesalers overseas to expand sizes because like I said, they make these giant quantities, right? So they make hundreds of thousands of pieces, sell them to many, many different people and get them into to many, many different stores. So the commitment to make 100,000 pieces in 26s, 28s, 30s is really, really big. Someone has to be the first. Someone has to be the wholesaler that says, we're gonna do this and we're gonna put it out there and we're gonna put this money into it and it's gonna be a big cost and we're gonna see if it works. But when you're talking about corporations, corporations don't love that risk. The corporations aren't taking the risk, which means we are not able to show them that we wanna shop their clothing, which means they cannot continue to take risk. Does that make sense? That brings us to the next question about how much it costs to start a plus size clothing line. These numbers can vary so wildly. I am only going to talk about what it costs for me to start manufacturing t-shirts. I have talked about this a little bit on Instagram and other places to just give everyone an understanding of what it takes to create your own merchandise and stuff. Uh, a lot of people are under the assumption that we just wholesale t-shirts and then print on them. That is absolutely not what we do. We actually created a t-shirt because we hated all the t-shirts that were out there that were women's fit t-shirts. So we made these t-shirts from XL to 6X. They are a poly cotton blend. Um, They're made ethically in the US. That means that the workers in the factory where they are manufactured get paid a living wage. All of the components of the shirt are also made in the US except for a thread that we use. Um, there is a portion of that thread that comes from overseas so we do mark that on our tags as well. Now of course getting anything manufactured in the US is going to cost more than getting it manufactured overseas. I think that that is worth it. I think that it's important. I think that we are moving in a way in our society where people are being more conscious of that and I also just think bringing jobs to the US no matter what is important. So that being said, the cost of starting this t-shirt line was $17,000. I believe we ordered three different shirts in two different colors. I believe the total of the tees that we ordered was about 2,000. So we got 2,000 t-shirts for $17,000. Not included in that $17,000 is of course the time it takes 
for me to create, for the people involved to create, for all of the communication that goes on. Also not included is all of the graphic designs. That is a completely separate cost. All of the printing of the t-shirts, completely separate cost. We are talking about $17,000 just to call up the manufacturer, give them our pattern, place the order, get our shirts. That's it. That cost is fucking enormous. I've never had $17,000. Never. Definitely not at one time. That is not a small amount of money. Uh, I've also talked about on Twitter and Instagram how I did not front that cost. That is not something that I came up with and then put into the universe. There's no chance I would have ever been able to do that. I have an incredible merchandising team that saw the demand for these shirts and wanted to take a chance on little old me. They wanted to do this project with me. They fronted the cost of the t-shirts. And then as the t-shirts sold, I still had to pay for printing and everything, but as the t-shirts sold, they got paid back their money. That process of paying them back, that $17,000, took about, I wanna say about 10 months. So it was not a small investment. Starting a clothing line is a huge investment. It is not something that people can just do. Um, how I did it, where I was like, wow, look, there's just someone who wants to front me some money, doesn't fucking happen. That is not the norm at all. Not even a little bit. Usually people have to get investors, they have to get business loans. There are a lot of plus size companies that come from like a really creative, good place, right? A lot of independent designers and maybe they go look for investors and these investors ask to own a portion of your company. They ask for kind of your blood, sweat and tears to finance you. Sometimes this is not something that these designers want, understandably. And that creates a lot of companies where you can't succeed because you don't have the financial backing. The cost of starting a clothing company is um, huge. And like I said, that doesn't include any of the cost for creating the designs. It doesn't include the marketing costs. It doesn't include photography costs. It doesn't include so, so many things. It doesn't include the literal hours of my life that are dedicated to this stuff. You know, like there is, there is a cost to time and all of that time that goes into that is money you could be making elsewhere. So those are all things to think about as well. I got a lot of two questions. One of them was, why is it so difficult to make inclusive lines? And the other one is, why is it so expensive to purchase larger sizes. I think I just spit. I'm not sure. Sorry. This is just a theory. I cannot know this for sure because I don't know every plus size manufacturer, obviously. However, creating inclusive lines is a gigantic risk. Most companies, especially companies that are not doing well because our economy is not doing well, because stores are closing everywhere, because everything's changing over to online sales. There is a big like shift going on in our marketplace right now. Many stores are already in a kind of tenuous position. Think about like JCPenney, you know? We don't have JCPenney's stores anymore. They're all closing. They're shifting all of their focus to online manufacturing. And so you think about all these huge stores that have all of these other focuses right and like they have to really save their bottom line most of these companies are going to be very risk averse they are not going to want to try this new big thing when they're already struggling with so many other things is that a good excuse no it's obviously not a good excuse to not be making inclusive lines is it a reason sure the thing that we have found overwhelmingly with the merch line that we created is that if you create inclusive sizes people will buy them. Um, overwhelmingly, our higher sizes are always the ones that sell out. People are excited to have access to things in higher sizes. Brands create loyalty in those sizes very, very quickly. And honestly, the competition in those sizes is very, very small. So it's pretty smart for brands to do it. However, it's a huge investment. And you know, brands will say like, we don't see people buying 
4X to 6X, but you also don't see brands pushing that marketing for those um, sizes. I really believe that there is this group of plus size people that have not been catered to. They do not expect to be catered to either. If you tell them that a new plus size range is coming out, they don't even look at it because they know it's not in their size. These people have never been able to find what they need or what they want, and so they don't take the time to look for it. Of course, why would you? You're just wasting your time. So this group of people really needs a lot of special attention and a lot of special marketing to them. You need a lot of focused energy on reaching that market, but as soon as you are able to reach that market, you sell the fuck out of those clothes. And you know, I think that people who are a size 34, 36 can tell you they have two or three stores that they shop at, that they know they can shop at, that they shop at every single time they're able to shop. So is it a big struggle to kind of get in those two or three shops? Is it a big deal to kind of let this group of people know that you are out there and you are making clothes in their size? Yes, absolutely. Is it worth it? Can it pay off? Yes. Absolutely. Are we finding that companies want to put in that time and energy right now with how the economy is, with how fucking the world is? Unfortunately, no. And the question that everybody wants to know is, does it actually cost more to make plus size clothing? I have a difficult answer for this and it comes in two parts. Does it cost more to make plus size clothing? Yes. I know that that is not the answer anybody wants to hear, but here's the thing. It costs more because materials do cost more. That is how all of this shit works. Materials cost money that directly reflects the end cost of all things. Let's look at straight size clothes. I'm gonna use Gap and Old Navy as an example because I think that they're really well known and we all know that Old Navy costs significantly more for plus sizes than they do for straight sizes and it's fucking bullshit. Hold up, I know, yes, it costs more to make these clothes and I still think it's bullshit, yes. Okay, I'll tell you why. If you look at Gap, they have been carrying size zero to 18 for years. Since I was a kid and cried because I couldn't fit into their size 18, they've been carrying them. It does cost less to create a size zero than it does for a size 18. You look at like finishings, like buttons and zippers and stuff like that, all of that obviously is the exact same cost. But in terms of just the fucking cloth, yes, it costs less. Yes, you are using less. But Gap has looked at their size zero to 18 and gone, okay, it costs this much to make a size zero, costs this much to make a size 18. Let's price them at this number so that everyone can pay the same price and the size zero is not benefiting more than the size 18. Let's just make the price inclusive of all of those sizes. Companies have been doing this for years. The issue is that, like we have discussed, plus size markets are new. So now these companies have to look at size zero to size 28 instead of size zero to 18. They have to look at the cost differentials between size zero and size 28 and decide where they wanna land on a cost that will not put them in the hole for size 28, but also not upset size zero because the price is going to go up a little bit. This is something that companies like Old Navy have just refused to take on. Instead of looking at their entire range, which goes from size zero to I believe like 32 or 34, instead of saying, okay, it, we're going to raise the straight sizes just a tiny bit so that we can then bring the plus sizes down and everyone's at the same level, they've said, no, you know what? We're just going to price the plus sizes where they need to be and keep the straight sizes where they need to be and not consider how that affects our customer at all. This is an issue for many reasons. When you charge plus size people more, it disenfranchises them more. It makes them feel not included. It makes them feel like they have to work harder to dress cute and it really alienates an entire population. So I believe that companies that do this really aren't getting the best they can get out of their plus size sales. I think they would see a massive increase in plus size sales if they did kind of do this with their prices between straight sizes and plus sizes. The issue is that again, Companies are risk averse. They do not want to alienate their size zero to 18 in order to help out the other market, even though 
this plus size market is growing at an incredible rate and the majority of people will soon be purchasing plus size clothing. The idea that a size zero, that people can figure out a size zero to 18 pricing that works for everyone between zero and 18 and can't do the same thing from size zero to 28 is just pandering to straight sizes. All it is saying is that they do not want to raise straight size costs. Um, and ultimately, if you were to consider the cost of goods and what it costs to make each of these sizes, the cost of straight sizes would go up a little bit and the cost of plus sizes would go down a little bit and they would all even out. But people believe that that's gonna hurt the straight size market and they don't wanna do that. Which obviously I think is bullshit. I think we know that overwhelmingly the average person is plus size and is going to be buying plus size clothes so we should be catering and focusing our attention on them but we continue to have companies not to do that. My best advice when it comes to that is to not shop places who do that price differential. You know I think of Universal Standard which they've had some questionable PR stuff happen but they are a really good example of a company who has said we are going to make clothing from size 0 to 40 and who has said this is one price and like this is who we're making it for. It's a really good example of how how you can do it and honestly companies like Gap and Old Navy who are using this huge price differential seem to just kind of be in the fucking dark ages with their pricing structures. It doesn't make sense. It is a type of fat tax. I will tell you even with my own um, merchandise range when we have our clothing manufactured it does cost more for me to purchase the 4x through 6x than it does the XL through 3x. Here's the thing though, you guys would never know that. Consumers don't need to know that. If I made shirts from XL to 3X, $25.99, and from 4X to 6X, $30.99, a huge part of my customer base would feel alienated. That is not a smart business move, so we don't do that. Nobody ever needs to know what I pay for clothing. All you need to know is that whatever people are buying is all the same. Everybody has the same opportunity to purchase the clothes as every other person. What I am saying is that it's a bad fucking business move to price plus size clothing higher than straight size clothing. I hope that this uh, video has been honest and reflective in that, in that yes, your feelings about the plus size industry are spot on. How you're feeling about the plus size industry and feeling like you're left out and that like people are not paying attention is spot on. And no, companies are not taking a chance on plus size people. Is it happening more than it was 10 years ago? Sure. Is there still a very, very long way to go? Yes, absolutely. The reason people feel disempowered and disenfranchised when we talk about plus size clothing is because they are. It's not something that's in your imagination. These practices are outdated. I would love to have a really active conversation in the comments down below. I am certain that I said something incorrectly in this video. I am certain that there are going to be follow-up questions. I am certain that some of you are gonna be able to provide me with more information. Please, please, let's continue this conversation in the comments down below. Uh, make sure you give this video a like if you learned anything. I will have links to a lot of the things we talked about in the description box. Uh, if you want to shop the merchandise line, it is always linked in my description box down below. And of course, if you think people need a little bit more light shed on the plus size industry, please share this video with your friends. Please keep fighting that good fight for plus size clothing and accessibility to plus size clothing. And I will see you all next time. Bye.